The relationship between Britain and Ireland has been one of the most enduring and complex conflicts recorded in history. Beginning in the 12th century, these neighbouring lands would embark on an 800 year struggle as Ireland fights for its freedom. The British Crown's authority over Gaelic Ireland begins with the arrival of the Normans and King Henry II in the 1100s. With the Reformation of the 1500s, Protestants gain power while Catholics are discriminated against and land is granted to those loyal to British rule. In the 1600s, lands in Ulster are granted to Presbyterian and Protestant planters from southern Scotland and northern England, changing Ulster's demographic forever. In the same century, greed intensifies and the introduction of the penal laws places further restraints on Irish Catholics. Inspired by the French and American revolutions, Irish Republicans launch a five-month rebellion in 1798, failing to overthrow British rule. In January 1801, under the Act of Union, Ireland is fully absorbed into the British Empire with the creation of a new state, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. With the collapse of the potato crop in 1840, a million people die from starvation and disease. Millions more are forced to emigrate to the United States, Canada, Britain and Australia. In the space of a decade, Ireland's population was nearly cut in half. Horrified by the outcome of the famine, the Irish people desperately needed a change. Some fought politically and strived for home rule. Others felt physical force was the only way. With the foundation of new organisations like the Gaelic Athletic Association and the Cunra na Gaeilge, Irish culture and Irish language are revitalised after centuries of decline under English authority. After finally achieving home rule, Britain declares war on Germany and the four year Great War puts home rule on hold. Some Republicans felt that Ireland had waited long enough and home rule and a parliament in Dublin city just wasn't enough. They wanted complete freedom and an independent Irish Republic. An uprising began on Easter Monday 1916. After a six day fight centering around Dublin city, 500 people were killed, most of them civilians. To avoid further civilian death, the rebels surrendered on Saturday the 29th of April. In the aftermath, thousands of Irish were rounded up and sent to prisons in England and Scotland, and 1,800 men were shipped to an internment camp in Frangach, Wales. Between May and August, 16 of the uprising's leaders were executed, 15 by British firing squads and one by hanging. In 1918, as the Great War ends, Britain calls for a general election, Irish party Sinn Féin have a landslide victory, winning 73 out of 105 seats. They decided to ignore Westminster and form their own Irish parliament in Dublin's mansion house. Meanwhile, in Tipperary, on the very same day, two RIC men were ambushed and killed by the 3rd Tipperary Brigade Irish Republican Army. The first Dáil Éireann and the Sala Hedbeg ambush both took place on the 21st of January 1919, initiating the Irish War of Independence. The Irish Republican Army fought the Royal Irish Constabulary and their British paramilitary groups such as the Black and Tans and the Auxiliaries over a period of two and a half years. In July 1921, Britain offered a truce and the war came to an end. The Anglo-Irish Treaty was signed in December that year, officially dividing Ireland with the six counties in the north remaining part of the UK. But this wasn't the only division that the treaty would cause. The Irish people were now split between those in favour of the treaty, known as pro-treaty, and those not in favour of the treaty, known as anti-treaty. The IRA split with the pro-treaty becoming the Free State National Army and the anti-treaty keeping the Irish Republican Army name. A brutal one-year civil war kicked off in June 1922. Nearly half a century later, in the 1960s, discrimination against Irish Catholics was at an all-time high in the north of Ireland. Large businesses, the courts, the police force and councils were mostly run by the Protestant Unionist majority and gave preference to other Protestants. The tensions between Republicans and Unionists would lead to a 30-year conflict in the north of Ireland, known as the Troubles. From the Normans arriving in Ireland in the year 1169 to the beginning of the Troubles in 1969, this marks exactly 800 years. But how did this massive conflict happen and where did it all begin? shouted at the same time to the section, keep firing and don't stop till I tell you. We weren't scared at all, as long as there be a, had a chance to fight back. Anyone that comes into my house, my country, and tries to take over by force, I'm going to kill him and I'll use any and every means to do it. The Lord have mercy on your souls, so the two of them were shot. 
So to understand how it all began, we have to go back to the 12th century in Ireland. So back in the 1100s, Ireland wasn't just one united land. In fact, it was far from it. Ireland was made up of kingdoms, and these kingdoms were known as Tuha. Now each of these kingdoms also had a king, and all of these kingdoms were broken down into five provinces. We had Ulster, Munster, Connacht, Leinster, and Mead. Now each of these five provinces also had a provincial king, and these provincial kings would compete against each other to be the number one or most powerful ruler of Ireland, the High King, or Os Gaeilge on Ard Ri. Now one of the most important characters you need to know about is a man called Diarmid Mac Murchida. Diarmid was born in the year 1110. He was a descendant of one of the most powerful families of Leinster called the Ekinsilic. Now Diarmid was fostered as a child which was actually very common practice for powerful families in Ireland at that time and in 1126 after the death of Diarmid's older brother Aina Diarmid was proclaimed King of Leinster at the age of 16 years old. 1152 is one of the most important years in the 12th century in Ireland. As kingdoms were growing more powerful, the province of Mead was actually stagnating and proving weak. So rival kingdoms of Ulster and Connacht moved on Mead to take the province, and they also invited one more rival, the King of Leinster, Diarmid Mac Murchidja. Now the crucial piece of information here is one very significant and powerful king was not invited to join in this feast. His name was Tiernan O'Rourke and he was King of Breifna. Tiernan's forces ended up falling apart, he lost some lands in Breifna and to rub more dirt in his wounds, his wife actually left him. But to make it even worse, she left him for Diarmid Mac Murchidja. Tiernan was left powerless, landless and wifeless and most of all absolutely furious with Diarmid Mac Murchidja. And even though it would take him 14 years, he would eventually get revenge. In 12th century Ireland, no king was ever secure in power. And we'll see that in the year 1166, when one of Diarmid Mac Murchidja's allies, Murkertach MacLachlan, defeated a mutual rival in the north of Ireland called Ocad Mac Dunchleva. Now, instead of killing Mac Dunchleva, he wanted to humiliate him further, so he blinded him. And by blinding him, he actually went against oaths that he had taken with the Archbishop of Armagh. And this led to MacLachlan's death. So now, Rurio Conquerbar of Connacht and Tiernan O'Rourke of Breifna went to Dublin to celebrate the death of Murkertach MacLachlan. Now, while they were there, they decided to join forces, Connacht, Breifna and Dublin, and move on Leinster to take Diarmid Mac Murchidja's kingdom from him. Diarmid Mac Murchidja now had two choices. He could stay in Ireland and fight, or he could retreat. And on the 1st of August, 1166, he decided to retreat. He fled Wexford and set sail for Bristol. When he arrived in Bristol, he stayed with a reeve of King Henry II called Robert Fitzharding. While he was with Robert, he described to him what he wanted to do back in Ireland. He wanted to recruit an army, go back to Ireland and retake his kingdom of Leinster and get revenge on the people that betrayed him. Fitzharding suggested that MacMurchida should talk to King Henry II. However, the king was already at war himself and was residing in France. So, Diarmid Mac Murchidja set sail for France and met King Henry II in the Loire Valley and made a promise to him before the court. I was born a Lord of Ireland. In Ireland, I was acknowledged king, but my own people have wrongfully cast me out from the kingdom. I come to appeal to you, fair sire, before the barons of your empire. I will become your liege man for as long as I live, provided that you will help me so that I do not lose everything. I will call you Lord in the presence of your barons and earls. Right now, for the first time in history, an Irish king is the liege man of the King of England. Now, King Henry II had no troops to spare, and he was also in a bitter dispute with the Archbishop of Canterbury, so he declined Diarmid an army, but he did accept his offer as liege man. Now, Diarmid had only one choice here. He went back to Bristol, where he lived a life of luxury, in fairness, but Diarmid Mac Murchidja was a man of action. He had no interest in this life of luxury at all. He wanted revenge, and his desire for revenge was only getting stronger and stronger as time went on. After spending some weeks in Bristol, Diarmid began travelling into South Wales to spread word of his mission back in Ireland. Soon after, his plans caught the attention of a Norman knight named Richard Fitzgilbert de Clare, more commonly known as Strongbow. Richard was Lord of Strigoil, which is current day Chepstow in Wales. He was a descendant of the most powerful Norman conquerors of England in 1066. Now, it was Richard's father, Gilbert, who actually earned the title Strongbow for his excellence with the weapon. Richard was his eldest son, so the nickname or title was essentially passed down. So Strongbow that invaded Ireland wasn't necessarily an incredible archer by any means. It was just a name that was passed down from his father. When Diarmid met Strongbow in 1167, he explained to him that if they joined forces, they could take Leinster together. Diarmid offered Strongbow two things, his eldest daughter Aoife's hand in marriage and lands in Wexford, totaling about 150,000 acres. Strongbow promised that if he could get the expedition off the ground without incurring trouble with King Henry II, he would make his way to Ireland. And that part about not incurring trouble with King Henry II, 
is absolutely crucial. On the 1st of May 1169, the Normans stepped foot on Irish soil for the first time ever. They arrived right here at Banno in County Wexford. The force was actually very small. It only consisted of about 400 men. There were some archers, some mail clad foot soldiers, some Norman lords and their families, and some Flemish knights. They came from Wales, which is just across the water, to my east. Finally, over one year later, Strongbow set sail from Milford Haven in Wales. On the 23rd of August, 1170, he arrived right here in Baggenbun, Wexford. He had an army of about 1,500 men, cavalry force, some knights, some archers and some foot soldiers. Two days later, the men stormed Watford and in the aftermath of the slaughter, Strongbow married Dermot MacMurkage's eldest daughter, Aoife. On the 1st of May 1171, Dermot MacMurkage passed away in Ferns County, Wexford from an unknown disease. Now, when Strongbow came to Ireland with his Norman forces, he did so without the permission of King Henry II. When King Henry II learned of the Normans' successes in conquering lands in Ireland, he became absolutely furious. He feared that he was losing control in the territory of the British Isles. So what did Strongbow do? Well, he lied. He convinced King Henry that all of his endeavours and conquering of lands in Ireland was actually in his name. So he met King Henry before the Royal Court in Pembroke in Wales. He gave him all of the lands in Watford, Wexford, Dublin, all of the ports and all of the castles. So that just left the Normans with some inland territories in Leinster, most of which they hadn't even conquered yet. Also, all of the Normans in Ireland had to acknowledge the King of England as their overlord. So I'm currently in Baggenbun in South Wexford, and to show you where King Henry II arrived, we need to go to South Waterford, and in order to do that, we need to cross the water. So let's jump on the ferry. We need to go right over there. After meeting Strongbow, King Henry II ordered his troops to prepare for departure to Ireland. Four and a half thousand men on 400 ships set sail from Pembroke in Wales to Crook in Waterford. On the 17th of October 1171, for the first time in history, an English king steps foot on Irish soil. King Henry II, alongside his four and a half thousand troops, landed here at Crook in County Waterford. King Henry stayed in Dublin for six months and left Ireland on the 17th of April 1172. Before he left, he had taken submission from some, but not all, of the Irish kings. The King of England then declared lordship over Ireland. In reality, he had control in or around parts of Dublin, but some of the Gaelic kingdoms remained as strongholds all around the country. 